behaviorism. While Freud and Erickson looked at what was going on in the mind, behaviorism rejected any reference to mind and viewed overt and observable behavior as the proper subject matter of psychology. Through the scientific study of behavior, it was hoped that laws of learning could be derived that would promote the prediction and control of behavior. Ivan Pavlov Ivan Pavlov was a Russian physiologist interested in studying digestion. As he recorded the amount of salivation his laboratory dogs produced as they ate, he noticed that they actually began to salivate before the food arrived, as the researcher walked down the hall and toward the cage. This, he thought, is not natural. One would expect a dog to automatically salivate when food hit their palate, but before the food comes? Of course, what had happened was, you tell me, that's right, the dogs knew the food was coming because they had learned to associate the footsteps with the food. The key word here is learned. A learned response is called a conditioned response. Pavlov began to experiment with this concept of classical conditioning. He began to ring a bell, for instance, prior to introducing the food. Sure enough, after making this connection several times, the dogs could be made to salivate to the sound of a bell. Once the bell had become an event to which the dogs had learned to salivate, it was called a conditioned stimulus. The act of salivating to a bell was a response that had also been learned, now termed in Pavlov's jargon, a conditioned response. Notice that the response, salivation, is the same whether it is conditioned or unconditioned, unlearned or natural. What changed is the stimulus to which the dog salivates. One is natural, unconditioned, and one is learned, conditioned. Let's think about how classical conditioning is used on us. One of the most widespread applications of classical conditioning principles was brought to us by psychologist John B. Watson. John B. Watson. John B. Watson believed that most of our fears and other emotional responses are classically conditioned. He had gained a good deal of popularity in the 1920s with his expert advice on parenting offered to the public. He tried to demonstrate the power of classical conditioning with his famous experiment with an 18-month-old boy named Little Albert. Watson set Albert down and introduced a variety of seemingly scary objects to him, a burning piece of newspaper, a white rat, etc. But Albert remained curious and reached for all of these things. Watson knew that one of our only inborn fears is the fear of loud noises, so he proceeded to make a loud noise each time he introduced one of Albert's favorites, a white rat. After hearing the loud noise, several times paired with the rat, Albert soon came to fear the rat and began to cry when it was introduced. Watson filmed this experiment for posterity and used it to demonstrate that he could help parents achieve any outcomes they desired if they would only follow his advice. Watson wrote columns in newspapers and in magazines and gained a lot of popularity among parents eager to apply science to household order. Operant conditioning, on the other hand, looks at the way the consequences of a behavior increase or decrease the likelihood of a behavior occurring again. So let's look at this a bit more. B.F. Skinner and Operant Conditioning B.F. Skinner, who brought us the principles of operant conditioning, suggested that reinforcement is a more effective means of encouraging a behavior than is criticism or punishment. By focusing on strengthening desirable behavior, we have a greater impact than if we emphasize what is undesirable. Reinforcement is anything that an organism desires and is motivated to obtain. A reinforcer is something that encourages or promotes a behavior. Some things are natural rewards. They are considered intrinsic or primary because their value is easily understood. Think of what kinds of things babies or animals, such as puppies, find rewarding. Extrinsic or secondary reinforcers are things that have a value not immediately understood. Their value is indirect. They can be traded in for what is ultimately desired. 
The use of positive reinforcement involves adding something to a situation in order to encourage a behavior. For example, if I give a child a cookie for cleaning a room, the addition of the cookie makes cleaning more likely in the future. Think of ways in which you positively reinforce others. Negative reinforcement occurs when taking something unpleasant away from a situation encourages behavior. For example, I have an alarm clock that makes a very unpleasant loud sound when it goes off in the morning. As a result, I get up and I turn it off. By removing the noise, I'm reinforced for getting up. How do you negatively reinforce others? Punishment is an effort to stop a behavior. It means to follow an action with something unpleasant or painful. Punishment is often less effective than reinforcement for several reasons. It doesn't indicate the desired behavior. It may result in suppressing rather than stopping a behavior. In other words, the person may not do what is being punished when you're around, but may do it often when you leave. And a focus on punishment can result in not noticing when the person does well. Not all behaviors are learned through association or reinforcement. Many of the things we do are learned by watching others. This is addressed in social learning theory. Social learning theory. Albert Bandura is a leading contributor to social learning theory. He calls our attention to the ways in which many of our actions are not learned through conditioning. Rather, they are learned by watching others. Young children frequently learn behaviors through imitation. Sometimes, particularly when we do not know what else to do, we learn by modeling or copying the behavior of others. A kindergartner on his or her first day of school might eagerly look at how others are acting and try to act the same way to fit in more quickly. Adolescents struggling with their identity rely heavily on their peers to act as role models. Sometimes we do things because we've seen it pay off for someone else. They were operantly conditioned but we engage in the behavior because we hope it will pay off for us as well. This is referred to as vicarious reinforcement. Bandura suggests that there is interplay between the environment and the individual. We are not just a product of our surroundings, rather we influence our surroundings. Parents not only influence their child's environment, perhaps intentionally through the use of reinforcement, etc., but children influence parents as well. Parents may respond differently with their first child than with their fourth. Perhaps they try to be the perfect parents with their firstborn, but by the time their last child comes along, they have very different expectations, both of themselves and their child. Our environment creates us, and we create our environment. Bandura and the Bobo Dog Experiment, and today's children and the media. Other social influences, TV or not TV, Bandura began a series of studies to look at the impact of television, particularly commercials, on the behavior of children. Are children more likely to act out aggressively when they see this behavior modeled? What if they see it being reinforced? Bandura began by conducting an experiment in which he showed children a film of a woman hitting an inflatable clown or bobo doll. Then the children were allowed in the room where they found the doll and immediately began to hit it. This was without any reinforcement whatsoever. Not only that, but they found new ways to behave aggressively. It's as if they learned an aggressive role. Children view far more television today than in the 1960s. So much, in fact, that they've been referred to as Generation M media. The amount of screen time varies by age. As of 2017, children 0 to 8 spend an average of 2 hours and 19 minutes. Children 8 to 12 years of age spend almost 6 hours on screen media. And 13 to 18 year olds spend an average of just under 9 hours a day in entertainment media use. The prevalence of violence, sexual content, and messages promoting foods high in fat and sugar in the media are certainly cause for concern and is subject of ongoing research and policy review. Many children spend even more time on a computer viewing content from the internet. The amount of time spent connected to the internet continues to increase 
with the use of smartphones that essentially serve as mini computers. And the way children and adolescents interact with the media continues to change. The popularity of YouTube and the various social media platforms are examples of this. What might be the implications of this? Main points to note about behaviorism. Behaviorists look at observable behavior and how it can be predicted and controlled. Pavlov experimented with classical conditioning, the process of conditioning a response to stimulus, the dog salivating to the bell. Watson offered advice to parents to show them how classical conditioning can be used. His most famous experiment was conditioning little Albert to fear a white rat. Skinner believed that reinforcing behavior is the most effective way of increasing desirable behavior. This is done through operant conditioning. Bandura noted that many behaviors are not learned through any type of conditioning, but rather through imitation, and he believed that people are not only influenced by their surroundings, but that they also have an impact on their surroundings. Theories also explore cognitive development and how mental processes change over time.